Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is our first trip to Greece, a country we have wanted to visit for our entire life. I'd also like to thank all of you for your stamina uh, and lasting until the, uh, th this late at night, and it's impressive to see the number of people who are here. I'd first like to begin with my, this slide and the next is my conflict of interest disclosures. Um, if you can't read it, there's something wrong with your eyes. Um, these are the organizations we've been funded for for our research throughout my career. In thinking about pharmacoepidemiology, uh, it reminds some people of this quotation by Sir William Osler, a desire to take medications is perhaps the greatest feature which distinguishes man from other animals. Certainly that's uh, better than this alternative quotation from Oliver Wendell Holmes, if the whole materia medica as now used could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. Unfortunately, too many people think about that when they think about their medication, and the, the solution to that, we hope, is the field of pharmacoepidemiology. What I will do in order to make sure everybody is on the same wavelength is briefly review the current drug approval process, the issues in the current drug approval process, the solution, which we think is pharmacoepidemiology, give you a big data drug study example and end with some conclusions. First, the current drug approval process. <laughs> Typically, in most of the world, drugs go through preclinical studies, followed by three phases of clinical studies, and then post-marketing studies, phase four studies, which are not always required. So the first phase is dose escalation. The second phase is dose ranging, the first time drugs are seen in patients. The third phase is pivotal trials, randomized trials required for registration. A drug is registered, and then there are, may or may not be phase four studies. The issues in this system are shown here, that the carefully selected subjects inherent in pre-marketing studies may not reflect the real-life patients in whom the drugs will actually be used. Second, study subjects may receive better care than real-life subjects. Third is pre-marketing studies are by definition short because otherwise the drug would never get on the market. Fourth, there's, there's no information available at the, uh, at the time of marketing about comparative effectiveness because typically pre-marketing randomized trials compare drugs to placebos to see if the drug works. That leaves open the clinical question of when do I use this drug versus when do I use this drug. Next is that increasing development costs over time leads to increasing need for immediate huge sales, so-called blockbuster drugs, a term we've heard before, um, and with that aggressive marketing. Typically, drug companies consider any drug that won't generate about $300 million a year in sales as uh, often too small to warrant use. But $300 million a year requires a lot of people to buy the drug. With that, direct-to-consumer advertising in some countries, like in the United States, leads to overuse of the drug by patients for whom use of the drug is not compelling. I can't tell you the number of patients I've had come to me with an advertisement that they've seen on television or in the newspaper saying, Doc, should I be on this drug? And my answer to them is, you see those drugs advertised on TV? They're exactly the ones you don't want to be on. Because A, they're more expensive. B, that means they're new and we don't really know what their side effects are. If it really, really was compelling, I would have put you on it already. Otherwise, steer away from them. Yet the typical drug development program with between 500 and 3,000 patients exposed prior to marketing cannot reliably detect adverse events with an incidence of less than one in 1,000, even if they're severe. It's baked into the statistics. With 3,000 patients, you can reliably detect adverse events of one in 100. Adverse events that are one in 1,000 or less common will not be detected prior to marketing even if they're extremely severe. So it's sort of like this. Uh, it says less than one in 10,000 
something like one in 14,000 gets these side effects. Hardly anybody gets these side effects. They're extremely rare. You should be very proud. Obviously, the people who suffer these side effects are not extremely proud. But these represent the bulk of much of what we study in pharmacoepidemiology, and I'll come back to that. The result is what I call opportunities. These are data from the US, now about a decade old, that fully 51% of drugs had label changes due to major safety issues discovered after marketing. These weren't minor changes. These were major safety issues. 20% of drugs got new blacks, black box warnings after a drug was marketed, and 4% were ultimately withdrawn for safety reasons. I call these the opportunities because these are the ones we found out about. How many are out there that we didn't find out about? Those are the roles for the field of pharmacoepidemiology. Other issues in the current system, there's no incentive for a pharmaceutical sponsor to complete promised post-marketing safety studies because all it'll find is bad news. And direct-to-consumer ads in the countries that allow them lead to overuse of the drug by patients for whom use of the drug is not compelling. So we have very limited data available as of the time a drug is marketed, by definition baked into the statistics, and yet right after a drug is launched, huge use in a large number of people, um, most of whom don't really need the drug, a, a recipe for disaster. The net effect is that the public misunderstands drug safety, thinking that post-marketing discovery of an adverse drug reaction means somebody messed up, when in fact it's baked into the system. Doesn't mean the company did anything wrong, doesn't mean the FDA did anything wrong, doesn't mean the physician did anything wrong, doesn't mean the pharmacist did anything wrong. It's simply baked into the system, and yet the public misunderstands that when a drug gets on the market, it means it's quote unquote safe. With that, there's increasing concern about the safety of our drugs. And this overreaction to that, F, uh, the, the regulator's overreaction to that, leads to increasing pre-marketing requirements with delayed access and drugs dropped from development. So I've seen a number of drug development programs extended now instead of 3,000 patients requiring 5,000 patients or 8,000 patients before marketing. That adds absolutely nothing. Statistically, it adds substantial cost and delay. In order to add statistically, you need to go from 3,000 patients to 30,000 patients, or 300,000 patients, not 8,000 patients. But the most expensive and slowest part of drug development is phase three. And if you delay phase three, it leads to drugs getting, becoming much more expensive, some being pulled from development, and the public never having access to them uh, because of that, simply as a regulatory overreaction to this, uh, uh, this biostatistical concept that's baked into the current situation. So it's sort of like this. Decisions usually involve risk. That includes therapeutic decisions. It includes regulatory decisions. And regulators need to, and commercial decisions. Regulators need to realize there is risk when they approve a drug from the market. Uh, for the market, and it, it's baked into the, the, the way that the system is designed. Well, the solution, we think, is pharmacoepidemiology. What is pharmacoepidemiology? By definition, it is the study of the use and effects of drugs in populations. So we saw a number of nice studies earlier today um, uh, showing information about the use of drugs in populations, descriptive studies about drug use, and I'll come back a little bit to that. Pharmacoepidemiology, again, studies the use of drugs in populations and the effects of drugs in large numbers of people, in populations of people. It applies the methods of epidemiology, population studies, to the content area of clinical pharmacology. So it's applying epidemiologic methods, doing studies in large numbers of people and populations to the content area of clinical pharmacology. Um, if you think of the spectrum of bench to bedside to population, um, you go from preclinical studies, proof of concept, efficacy, clinical effectiveness, and effective policies. Pharmacoepidemiology covers this part of that equation. 
The designs used in pharmacoepidemiology are shown here. They're the typical study designs used in epidemiology. Descriptive studies, that is analyses of secular trends using vital statistics data, case series, case reports, and the, descript and the studies we saw uh, before, the descriptive studies, are nice examples of those descriptive studies. As you move then to analytic studies, you add control groups, doing case control studies, retrospective and prospective cohort studies, and experimental studies. Now, to be sure everybody's using the terms as I go through this in the same way, a part of what you learn is epidemiologists like jargon. Not all epidemiologists use the same jargon in the same way. So what I'll show you is the way I'll be using the terms. Um, I'm, I'm sure these are all Greek terms, so you know uh, uh, what, what they really mean. But, uh, but, uh, but I'll, I'll show you the way I use them, which is the way probably a, at least a plurality of epidemiologists use it. So both cohort and case control studies are intended to give the same basic information inherent in this so-called two by two table. That is whether an exposure is present or absent, whether a disease is present or absent. The difference is a cohort study approaches it in this direction, recruiting people into the study on the basis of the presence or absence of exposure. And the process of the study looks at whether at subsequent disease development. A case control study approaches the two by two table this way, backwards, recruiting people on the basis of the presence or absence of disease, that is their cases or their controls, and the process of the study looks at the antecedent exposures. Now, we used to use the, the terms cohort and case control uh, synonymous with the terms prospective and retrospective. Nowadays, we make a distinction. We have prospective study or studies simultaneously with the events under study. Retrospective studies are after the events under study, and so somehow have to recreate those events that happened in the past using questionnaires like what we saw before, chart abstracts, um, or nowadays wide, widespread use of databases. And I'll, I'll show you at the end of the talk uh, an example of that. We use the terms prospective and retrospective differently from cohort and case control. Most cohort studies are prospective, most case control studies are retrospective, but you certainly nowadays can do either prospective or retrospective cohort studies especially given the availability of, of large databases. Well, these are the usual approaches used in epidemiology. What makes pharmacoepidemiology different? First, a large population needs to be studied. As I alluded to, you've already studied maybe 3,000 patients before marketing. So now you need to study 10,000 patients or 100,000 patients rather than 3,000 patients. So these need to be big studies. Second, randomized trials are less likely to be productive of new information because you've done them already. Third is the answers often must be obtained very quickly because when they arise, they arise as clinical, regulatory, public health um, crises and commercial crises. So answers need to be obtained extremely quickly. So you need to do massive studies and do them very quickly. And that has really been the hallmark of the field of pharmacoepidemiology, is developing the ability to do these massive studies and do them quickly. And we'll talk uh, in a little while about how. Other differences in pharmacoepidemiology compared to the rest of epidemiology, uh, the typical exposure to an epidemiologist is dichotomous. You're exposed, you're not exposed. When you're dealing with drugs, exposure is much richer than that. You've got issues of dose, you've got issues of duration. There's all sorts of things that, that are, in addition, it's not electromagnetic field exposure, it's not yes or no to smoking, yes or no to occupation. You need to take into account the, the, all of the detail inherent in uh, exposure to drugs. Second, drug exposures have benefit. They're given to help people. And because they're given to help people, simply showing a safety problem isn't enough. You need to be able to quantify it because you want to be able to quantify that safety problem in the context of the benefit. So you can figure out a risk benefit. The fact that a drug has a problem isn't enough, shouldn't be enough to kill a drug. You need to quantify that safety problem to put it in the context of the drug's benefit. <coughs> 
And lastly, unlike most exposures of interest to epidemiologists, exposure to drugs is deliberate. What that means is people who get drugs are inherently different than people who don't get drugs. And that affects their outcomes. Assuming physicians are rational, and I realize that's an assumption, you, you would expect that people who get drugs are sicker than people who don't get drugs. So if you look at their outcomes, their outcomes are going to be worse than the people who don't get drugs. And that difference where the people who get the drugs have a worse outcome than the people who don't get drugs um, shouldn't be blamed on the drug because it's inherent in the way the physicians have selected patients to get the drug. Other key differences, some of these studies can be very expensive. We recently completed a large, simple, not quite so simple clinical trial as a, a uh, post-marketing uh, randomized trial, which cost $75 million for one study. That's the extreme. Actually, I, th I think it might have been $85 million. It's the extreme, but, it, but it's certainly, some of these studies can be very expensive because they need to be very large. Second, there's a huge role played by industry in at least three different ways. One is industry decides what studies are done before marketing, and with that, they determine what information is not known as of the time of marketing, and so what remains to be studied by epidemiology. Second, industry provides a lot of the funding for pharmacoepidemiology studies, um, when, particularly when regulators require them to provide it, to fund it. Third is the role of contract research organizations. I don't know if you have such uh, corporations in Greece or not, but in a lot of the rest of the world, um, there are, there are for-profit companies whose business is to do research. And companies often go to those for-profit entities when they want to be able to control the outcome. So if the outcome isn't helpful to them, it won't get published. If the outcome is helpful to them, it'll get published. In contrast, if you give a study to an academic center, an academic center, if they're being responsible, should publish the results regardless of what the results are. So the availability of contract research organizations and um, the fact that there is some selectivity in who, what gets published and what doesn't get published is another major issue in, uh, when, in studying drugs, particularly af after marketing. There's also the complex interplay between industry and regulators. In general, that's the regulators requiring industry to do a study, in which case industry might try to do a study that really doesn't show something. But we've been involved in situations where the companies, being extremely responsible, want to study drug safety, and the FDA has objected. And the companies have done the studies over the objection of FDA in order to be able to, to find the, the, out the safety of their drugs. So it's not just one direction, it can work either way. There's enormous public interest in drug safety. You saw a few headlines before. There's, there's endless headlines, certainly in the US. And it's a field with a, uh, which is rife with a risk of conflict of interest. Part of that conflict of interest is financial. And I showed you my conflict of interest slides in the beginning. But I think actually a bigger conflict of interest is intellectual and academic. That people who are wedded to their database and say, I want to prove these data are right, and so anyone who disagrees with my data are wrong, or they're wedded to their hypothesis, or they simply have an enemy, and, they, and whatever this person publishes, they want to publish something uh, that says the opposite. So there's all sorts of different kinds of conflicts of interest here. Finally, methodologic issues of special concern. One of them is measurement of exposure. Those of you who are, are physicians or pharmacists or medical students who are in clinical years will know that, that most patients don't know what their drugs are even now. You're lucky if they know it's their black pill or their, their blue pill. They're certainly not going to really know it's their blood pressure pill or their diabetes pill. And then definitely not going to know the dose and how long they're on it and so on. So measuring exposure um, is actually quite hard to do because most patients don't really know what they're taking. 
The other is the issue of confounding by indication or channeling, and this is what I referred to before, the, the fact that people who get a drug are inherently different than people who, get a, who don't get a drug. And even when you compare two different drugs, they may be given to two different populations, so that the comparison may not be a fair comparison. So let's talk a little bit about the history of pharmacoepidemiology. In the 1950s, chloramphenicol, uh, then a widely used, certainly very effective antibiotic, was linked to causing aplastic anemia. In response to which, 1952 saw the first textbook of adverse drug reactions. 1954, the American Medical Association began a registry on blood dyscrasias in response. Ironically, um, in response to this, um, this is a drug, at least in the US, which is rarely used now because of people being afraid of blood dyscrasias. Ironically, almost everybody who got aplastic anemia in the US have been given the antibiotic for cold for an upper respiratory infection. So they didn't need it in the first place and got this life-threatening condition in response. 1960, the Food and Drug Administration began sponsoring a hospital-based drug monitoring program at Johns Hopkins where pharmacists, where uh, pharmacy monitors were put in a hospital doing hospital-based cohort studies, looking at what drugs people got in the hospital, looking at how, how long they were in the hospital, and what happened to them after they got the drug. So it relied completely on pharmacists to run it, um, particularly clinically trained pharmacists, and again, it was hospital-based cohort studies. 1961, FDA began collecting adverse reaction reports. You heard much more this morning about spontaneous reports, pharmacovigilance. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 1961, the discovery of the so-called thalidomide disaster. And again, you heard about that earlier today. In response, 1962, the U.S. passed the Kefauver-Harris Amendments, which is the first time drugs were required to have evidence of efficacy before they could be approved and the first time companies were required to provide evidence of safety before a drug could be marketed. The mid-1960s saw the first descriptive studies of drug utilization. 1966, the Boston Collaborative Drug Surveillance Program basically did something very similar to what Hopkins had done, um, the, but this time using nurse monitors instead of pharmacy monitors. In 1968, saw the establishment of the UK Committee on Safety of Medicines. For all of these reasons, sometimes people point to the 1960s as the beginning of the field of pharmacoepidemiology. 1970, cleoquinol, a drug used for traveler's diarrhea, was linked to a decade epidemic of, of, uh, of SMAN, subacute demyelinating optic neuropathy, only in Japan, the first hint of pharmacogenetics that the Japanese were susceptible to this and other countries weren't. It took 10 years for this to be discovered and the drug to be pulled from the market. 1971 saw a publication of the link between clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina and cervix uh, and in utero exposure to DES, diethylstilbestrol, um, a synthetic estrogen given um, to treat or prevent uh, habitual or threatened abortion, never proven to work but that doesn't change you know, physician practices. Um, and the, again, 20, that was in the early 1950s. Then in the early 1970s, it was linked to these women developing this, this very rare tumor at a very unusual age. The mid-1970s, the ocular mucocutaneous syndrome, I have to say that slowly. Again, it probably comes from Greek. You guys can probably say it quickly, but, uh, uh, um, but um, an unusual syndrome linked to Practolol, the first beta blocker, uh, which then got removed from the market on the United Kingdom. Uh, 1975, development of case control surveillance by the Drug Epidemiology Unit, a spin-off of the Boston Collaborative Drug Surveillance Program, still using nurse monitors in hospitals, but instead of focusing on hospital-based cohort studies, doing hospital-based case control studies, that is looking at the reasons people were hospitalized and the lifetime history of drug exposure before that. 1976 to 1970, the Joint Commission on Prescription Drug Use. This was a commission triggered by Senator Ted Kennedy in the US who wanted to regulate industry more tightly. 
Industry said, you don't need to because there's this field then called drug epidemiology. That has all the answers. Uh, don't regulate us. Um, Kennedy said, prove it. Um, and industry funded this commission to do what ended up being a state-of-the-art report of the, where the field was at the time. 1977 saw so a development of, of COMPAS, the first of the large databases that I'll talk more about. 1980, without going through it in, in um, uh, as much detail, development of prescription event monitoring in the United Kingdom. Uh, 1980, ticrenophen linked to liver disease, a, a thiazide-like uh, diuretic, very effective, um, but ended up killing people from liver disease. Um, it was a French drug. Didn't, the French didn't seem to recognize that problem, but when the drug was marketed in the US, there were these reports of death from liver disease, and the drug was removed from the market. Ultimately, there were criminal charges, uh, not only against the company who marketed it, but against the individuals who were supposed to have reported the spontaneous reports, the pharmacovigilance we talked about this morning. Um, and um, all of them, parenthetically, not only dropped out of medicine, but they, they went into law. You don't necessarily need to be ethical to be a lawyer. Um, um, my, 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 my daughter's a lawyer, so I need to be careful, but uh, uh, 1982, binoxaprofen, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, what came out, uh, again, killing people from liver disease. In this case, it was known, based on the experience in the UK, that it caused this, and there was a deliberate, came out in criminal uh, court cases later uh, in the US, there was a deliberate business decision to withhold that information from the FDA, despite a legal requirement to provide all information about the effects of, of the drug, um, figuring they're going to lose the drug, uh, but how much money can they make before the drug disappeared? Um, Zemiprac and NSAID uh, mark, uh, marketed for, anaphy anaphy um, for pain and the, removed from the market for causing anaphylaxis, uh, bendectin uh, used for morning sickness, um, and removed because it didn't cause birth defects, um, which may seem like I misspoke, but I didn't. There were a wave of suits, um, including judgments um, against the company overturned by the judge. So jury verdicts overturned by the judge, unheard of in the American court system, but, but um, because of lack of evidence, uh, overturned by the judge due to lack of evidence. But their insurance rates went up so high that they removed the drug from, from the market. Um, and, and so on, again, I won't go into it. 1990s, these are just a few of the circumstances that I was personally involved in in the 1990s. So the history of the field has been this increasing punctuation of accusation that a drug causes an outcome and then needing to respond to that accusation and respond very quickly. The accusations almost always come from the spontaneous reporting system, pharmacovigilance, as we heard about this morning, and then you need to mount a study a pharmacoepidemiology study in order to respond to it. So there was a question in the audience this morning about what happens to the pharmacovigilance data once it's reported. The answer is these are hypotheses, and those hypotheses need to be followed up by formal studies generally in order to find out whether or not the hypotheses uh, bear out as, as true. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Other recent applications in the US, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, which is an organization that accredits all hospitals in the United States, now requires every hospital in the country to have an adverse drug reaction monitoring program and a drug use evaluation program. The CERTs, or the Centers for Education and Research and Therapeutics, are a federally funded uh, set of, of uh, organizations across the country academic organizations funded in order to be able to address inappropriate drug use. Mechanistic studies, drug utilization review, focus on patient safety, um, the um, in multiple institute of medicine initiatives, and then most recently as part of Obamacare, as part of the Affordable Care Act, the formation of, of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute with a, a ma major focus on comparative effectiveness research.
other recent initiatives from a regulatory point of view. FDA now has new regulatory authority specifically related to pharmacoepidemiology. It has stricter conflict of interest rules and increased focus on risk management, um, the active management of the way uh, physicians use drugs through industry, because FDA doesn't regulate uh, uh, drug doctors or pharmacists, it regulates only industry. Uh, Data-oriented, FDA has now a series of, of epidemiology contracts and, mo and now has, by law, um, put in place a, a, a program called Sentinel. Uh, Sentinel was required by Congress to have at least 100 million lives. It's now approaching 150 million lives of, in data to be able to do large studies of the kinds that, that I'll, I'll show you a, uh, an example of. Other things, the FDA has a Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee, and, and we started with, with FDA, a uh, pharmacoepidemiology certificate program that we went down to teach them about. Well, how, is, how are pharmacoepidemiology studies done? Uh, first is spontaneous case reports of adverse reactions. Again, pharmacovigilance, you heard about that a lot this morning. The role of pharmacovigilance um, is to identify uh, hypotheses, and those hypotheses remain to be tested. Second, aggregate population-based data sources, uh, you, that is vital statistics information, uh, which certainly you could use here in Greece as well. Uh, third is computerized collections of data from organized medical care programs, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more and give you an example of that. Uh, data collected specifically for pharmacoepidemiology on an ongoing basis, like the Boston Collaborative Drug Surveillance Program um, that I mentioned. Existing data collected as part of other ad hoc studies. This is where you're in the lucky situation that the database or data set already exists and you just have to reanalyze it. And finally, data collected de novo, like this massive randomized trial that I mentioned to you. Spontaneous reporting, again, pharmacovigilance, another name for it. Um, the term under-reporting assumes that increasing reporting is an answer to the problem. It probably is not. I think the thing to realize is somebody asked this morning about what proportion of reports, what proportion of adverse reactions are reported. Um, FDA commonly assumes 10 percent. That's probably a vast over estimate, it's probably closer to 1% or 0.1%. Um, I, you know, I used to run the system at our hospital, the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Before we started, we reported 10 adverse reaction reports a year. Uh, within a year, we were reporting 1,000 a year, just to give you a sense of level of underestimate. And for a hospital our size, there probably were 3,000 a year that could have been reported, but we didn't want the codeine nauseas, the penicillin rashes, because they weren't going to contribute new useful information. So the degree of underreporting is massive. But the answer isn't, probably isn't reporting more. We already get well over 1,000 reports a day throughout the US. Do we really want more than that? What's important to realize is the plural of anecdote is not data. These remain anecdotes. They're useful as clinical anecdotes. They, were, they are, remain the major way we discover adverse reactions is using pharmacovigilance and spontaneous reporting. It, it, it is a critically important system in order to detect possible adverse reactions. But once you detect possible adverse reactions, you then need to go on and do formal studies in order to see whether they are real. And a number of the questions in the audience sort of this morning were getting at that question. And, and the questions were correct. And the, the, how you do those studies is what pharmacoepidemiology is about. I've talked about um, computerized sources of billing data. Let me just briefly describe that. Um, if somebody goes to a pharmacy and gets a drug dispensed, if they have health insurance, that the bill for that drug goes to the insurance carrier, and they have to identify what the drug is. And, how much is given and what the drug is uh, results in different payments. So these are relatively valid data. Someone goes to a hospital or a physician and gets uh, medical care. If, they go, if bills for that care go to the same insurance carrier, 
Those data linked by a common identifier, uh, generally an insurance number, represent an enormously useful tool for research <clears throat> that, again, uh, those of us in the field have now been using for 35 years. Nowadays, these are claims data, um, uh, or, or the equivalent of claims data, uh, uh, the, and, and I'll show you a, a, a study, you, uh, encounter data is the term used, and I'll show you as an example a study that goes through that, that, that uses it. But that's a, um, nowadays we've shifted and more and more use electronic health record data. Um, the, the advantage of the claims data is the validity of the drug data. The disadvantage is the uncertain validity of the diagnosis data. So you need to go back and get medical records to validate those data. When you're using electronic health da data, you don't have to validate the medical information because that's what you're analyzing is the medical information itself. So it, it is an enormous advantage. That said, we in the US will never be able to use electronic health record data from our country because you, you need a health system and we have no health system. Um, so what we, what we do for electronic health record data is we go to the UK and we use the UK electronic health record data because they have an electronic health system. And there's two very large databases in the United Kingdom, <clears throat> databases of, of a general practitioner's data that is used for that purpose. Risk management, I mentioned, um, two general categories, informational interventions or active or administrative programs. Informational interventions are educating physicians, educating patients, educating pharmacists about their drugs. Um, it has been very well shown over and over and over again that, e that education does nothing. That, and it's important because this came up in prior, a number of prior discussions. Education is necessary but not sufficient. Educating students is very useful. They're capable of learning still. Once physicians get into practice, they're ineducable. Um, and I, I speak as, as a physician uh, in practice. Um, and so educational interventions are necessary, but not sufficient to change behavior. If you want to change behavior, change clinical practice, you need to move to active or administrative programs that in some way directly intervene and change the way people practice. And there are all sorts of ways now of doing it and lots of creative new approaches, undoubtedly, that, that, that could be uh, arrived at. But it's important to realize that education by itself won't change behavior, but it needs to be paired with administrative interventions. So thinking about risk management, it's sort of like this, uh, this married couple. Uh, risk perception, as they notice this rock there, risk assessment as they argue about whether or not there's a risk there um, in a typical marital fashion. Um, and then risk management as it starts to fall and they run away. And those are the, really the three general uh, uh, concepts as, as you think conceptually about risk management. Well, let me give you an example uh, from a recently published um, uh, example from our own work. <clears throat> This is a study, a cohort study, of pioglitazone and bladder cancer in patients with diabetes. Um, we, we recently published the, 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 the final paper in the series, and you'll see what I mean by that, um, in JAMA uh, a few months ago. The risk of bladder cancer, um, when this drug, um, a pioglitazone, uh, Actos is the brand name in the U.S. I don't know if you, do you have it in Greece? Yeah, you do, okay. Uh, when this drug was marketed, it was clear based on preclinical in vivo studies that there was an increased risk of, of bladder cancer uh, with pioglitazone and certain other drugs uh, that are related to it. Present in male rats, not in female rats or in mice of either gender. There was very limited human data on this question. Ultimately, after we began our study, the proactive study, a randomized trial, uh, uh, came out with data, a non-significant excess of bladder cancer versus placebo when added to other drugs, 14 in one group, six in the other group, not statistically different, but suggestive. In 2003, the Food and Drug Administration requested that the manufacturer of pioglitazone conduct a safety study to assess whether therapy with pioglitazone increases the risk of bladder cancer, with the specification that it needed a minimum of 10 years of follow-up from the study launch. Um, 
So again, the question was there 2003 as of the time of marketing, based on the animal data, and later based on spontaneous reports um, as well. Um, and they went to the company to say, you have to do this study. And the company came to us to do the study. So the, the uh, aim was to test the hypothesis that the risk of bladder cancer in patients with diabetes who receive pioglitazone differs from that of other patients with diabetes after controlling for potential confounding variables. Um, other re uh, recent history of this question. So December 2003, we launched this study using data from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Um, this is a population of about 2 million people to have important perspective, given it's substantially less than the population of, of Greece um, in doing the study. 2010, we presented the midpoint analysis, the five-year data, um, at the International Society for Pharmacoepidemiology meeting and, and published it in Diabetes Care. <clears throat> midpoint analysis of the cohort with data through April 30th, 2008. This was an a priori decision before we began the study. We were going to publish the midpoint data because if there was a problem here, we didn't want to wait 10 years to identify the problem. What we saw at that midpoint analysis is no significant increase in bladder cancer <clears throat> among patients with ever versus never use of the drug. But evidence of an increased incidence of bladder cancer with long-term therapy with pioglitazone. And in fact, post hoc analyses we did at that point, again, these are the midpoint data, showed, and all these slides are going to be organized the same way, this is the exposure group, number of subjects, the adjustment for age and sex, the fully adjusted group, compared to the unexposed group, as you can see as you went up in duration, you saw an increased risk. And this was a statistically significant increased risk. Again, these are data through April 30th, 2008. So overall, there was no overall association. This duration effect was not an a priori hypothesis, but looked suggestive. But again, this was the midpoint analysis. This wasn't the final analysis and was interpreted accordingly um, the, the, um, the, as we then continued the study. Um, what were the results of that publication acutely? Massive lawsuits. And, and FDA warnings, and zeroing in on this language here, jurors blame Actos once again in 2013. A Maryland jury ruled that Decatur, the company that manufactures, is at fault. Ultimately, there was a jury verdict of over, for one case of over $9 billion. That's billion, a thousand million. I know the UK uses the word billion different than the US uses the word billion. So it's a, 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 in one case. And FDA issued a warning, an alert, that people who take Actos for one year are 40% more likely to be uh, diagnosed with bladder cancer. That comes, oops, that 40% is here. That, that's where that came from. This non-significant increased risk, although there was a significant trend, resulted in a massive wave of suits and regulatory action. This was a study that wasn't done. It was the midpoint of a study. <coughs> um, after that, there were multiple other studies that reproduced our findings in the same way. If you, and this is now a meta-analysis across them. So if you look at multiple different studies, looking at ever treated, more than 21 months, this specifies the, the drugs, uh, uh, the, the designs. It was, they were all suggestive, confirming our results using designs almost identical to ours, deliberately to see if they could reproduce it. That greater than two years of use might be associated with bladder cancer. So let me give you the final results now. So the overall design was a retrospective cohort study with a nested case control study. The time period now is January 1997 through December 31st, 2012. So it's from when the drug was first available through the end of 2012 uh, and with over a decade of follow-up. 
setting was Kaiser Permanente Northern California. We use their electronic medical record linked to their diabetes registry, linked to their cancer registry, using their pharmacy records and using the laboratory records all linked together to do this study. We had close to 200,000 patients, about 1.6 million person years of follow-up overall. Median duration of follow-up was 7.2 years among the pioglitazone um, uh, untreated patients and 6.1 years among the treated patients. Median duration of therapy with pioglitazone was 2.8 years, but a range up to 13 years of follow-up. One third of the pioglitazone exposed subjects had started the drug over eight years earlier and had over four years of use. So again, remember in the interim results, we began to see an association with over 24 months of use. If the drug causes cancer, you add another five years of follow-up, you would expect the association to get a lot stronger because it wouldn't be a surprise that, that um, uh, it takes a number of years for a drug to cause cancer. So what, what did we see? Arranged the same way, bladder, this is the bladder cancer incidence rate in those unexposed and those exposed with adjustment, no increased risk. Again, ever versus never use did not see an increased risk. If you look at now the 10-year data on duration, same analysis as you increase use, if there's any increased risk at all, it disappears as, as risk as, as use continues. Exactly the opposite of what you'd expect if this was a biologic phenomenon. And clearly different than we had the suggestive data at five years. We then did a nested case control study allowing us to adjust the way comparing within the cohort cases of bladder cancer to controls without bladder cancer, adjusting for things we could go back to the medical record and get in more detail important for bladder cancer like cigarette smoking, occupation, things that were known risk factors for bladder cancer, and again, no increased risk with prolonged use. Though again, this little bit of a blip, not statistically different as you get to the middle duration of use. So why the differences between the five-year results and the 10-year results? One theoretical possibility is the publicity, enormous publicity. I still see ads on television after this came out showing no risk. I still see ads on television from lawyers saying, if you've ever had bladder cancer on our Actos, call this telephone number so we can sue. So there's enormous publicity. Could that be the cause? Probably not because the data was largely from prior to that first publicity. Could it be a detection bias? Um, but we, we are seeing increased risk with longer duration of therapy. If it was a detection bias, you'd expect to see it uh, earlier, right after your put on the drug. And there's no obvious stage shift. We, we aren't seeing the people on pioglitazone disproportionately having early stage disease, which is what you'd expect if, if this was a detection bias. Could it be chance? The methods were exactly the same. And if anything, the second time through, we have a bigger sample size. The associations in the five-year interim analyses were only marginally statistically significant. But so you could say, well, maybe the five-year data were chance except that multiple other studies showed the same short-term results, which mean it's not likely to be due to chance. So our conclusions were that every use of pioglitazone is not associated with an increased risk of bladder cancer. That's clear in all of the results. The previously observed increased incidence with long-duration therapy was less strong and not statistically significant in, this, in the final analysis and that the difference between the final results and the prior studies could be explained by detection bias, maybe. Maybe tumor promoter biology, where the drug is, doesn't cause the disease, but it promotes the disease. So somebody who has bladder cancer, it comes to clinical attention more quickly. Maybe temporal changes in prescribing patterns or temporal changes in bladder cancer screening were less likely due to chance. The other conclusion? Take one, one a day until the prescription runs out or they release a new study, whichever comes first. The, the point is, 
when you are planning a 10-year study, don't act on it until the 10 years are over. So finally, in conclusion, um, uh, the discovery of a, a, the, this QRS complex um, for, the, uh, for an EKG um, is a nice description of the oscillations in the development of a drug. A drug is discovered, another one of his fool ideas, he's a crackpot. Then suddenly, it's found to work for something. Gee, it's wonderful, it's simple, cheap, and cures magically. That's typically when it's released on the market, you don't yet have information about its safety. Suddenly, case reports, pharmacovigilance, showing death from agranulocytosis. It's a poison, I wouldn't give it to a dog. People overreacting to the case reports, sometimes with removal of the drug from the market inappropriately. Finally, you reach a plateau, used carefully in selective cases, it's the best therapy for whatever disease. As you get more information. Pharmacoepidemiology is never gonna make this QRX complex disappear. This is the life cycle of, of a drug. The goal of the field is to narrow it so that we can reach that plateau and make rational decisions earlier. Thank you. I would like to thank you, Professor Strom, for introducing us in the field of pharmacoepidemiology in this excellent way. This is a state-of-the-art lecture. Usually there are no questions, but I think in case we have a couple of questions, Professor Strom would be keen to answer. May I have your permission, please? Okay. Is there any question from the audience? Yes, please. Should I take my earphones there? Ο καθηγητής Albert Wertheimer, τον οποίο πιθανότατα τα γνωρίζετε, I repeat, Professor Albert Wertheimer, professor at Temple University, τον οποίο πιθανότατα τα γνωρίζετε, έχει γράψει ένα σύγγραμμα σχετικά με τη συμπεριφορά των ασθενών απέναντι στα φάρμακα και μέσα από τη συμπεριφορά αυτή, όπου βάζει βέβαια και διάφορες ψυχολογικές παραμέτρους, όπως και παραμέτρους ομαδικής ψυχολογίας, προσπαθεί να δει τις σύγχρονες όψεις και απόψεις της φαρμακοπαιδημιολογίας. Ε, δυστυχώς δεν παρακολούθησα όλη σας την ε, διάλεξη, αλλά θα ήθελα να κάνετε ένα σχόλιο ή να αναφερθείτε πάνω στις διαφοροποιήσεις της συμπεριφοράς των ασθενών απέναντι στα φάρμακα, απέναντι κυρίως στις εντολές των γιατρών και απέναντι, αν θέλετε, στην αντίσταση που εμφανίζουν, απέναντι στους adherents, στις προσπάθειες συμμόρφωσης που ενδεχομένως εμφανίζουν οι φαρμακοποιοί. Ε, σκεφτείτε όλα αυτά που σας λέγω και που ρωτάω στις συνθήκες κρίσης της ελληνικής. Σκεφτείτε τις συνθήκες αυτές στον ακραίο χώρο, τον συνοριακό χώρο του Εύρου. Ευχαριστώ. Uh, thank you. I, I missed the very beginning of what you said, but I think I understood your question. Um, and I certainly know uh, Dr. Wertheimer well. Um, compliance, or what we more typically nowadays refer to as he, ad, adherence, um, is really very, very key, as the prior uh, session and the prior workshop talked about. Um, and let me differentiate the effects of adherence on drug effects from the effects of adherence on pharmacoepidemiology studies. Um, um, it's critically important that patients take their drugs. They can't work if they don't get into people's mouths. Um, and uh, there's reasonably good data that half of all prescriptions, 40 to 50 percent in a lot of the world, never even get filled, no less make their way from the bottle into people's mouths. And clearly it makes no sense from a societal point of view to be paying for drugs that aren't going to help. Um, from a commercial point of view, of course, if you double adherence, you double sales. So it is in sponsors' interest 
to be able to improve adherence. Um, and at least in the United States, there is a lot of interest from industry, and it sounded from the symposium earlier today, perhaps in Greece too, despite the, the crisis, in trying to have their drugs used as much as possible. Patients will be happier about them, physicians will be happier about them, uh, uh, pharmacists will be happier about them. You know, drugs don't work if you don't take, take them. That said, adherence always remains a huge issue. Um, and the financial aspects of having to pay for the drugs yourself make that even harder. Now again, there are ways to address it, and some earlier speakers talked about things like use of generics and, and, and uh, creative modern approaches like, like using apps um, and iPhones to try to in increase adherence. But this is a wide open field with a lot of research needed, not a lot of clear answers. From the perspective of pharmacoepidemiology studies, in contrast, um, if a patient doesn't take a drug, then obviously they can't suffer the adverse reaction. They also can't get the beneficial effect. So whatever you see in terms of pharmacoepidemiology effects, in terms of relative risk, like in the example I gave you, the real effect in people who really were taking the drug is probably larger 